In April of 1984, Tina Sharp's remains were found almost three years to the day after her mother Sue, her brother Johnny, and Johnny's friend Dana Wingate were found brutally murdered. Would this discovery lead to answers of what happened in Cabin 28? Join us as we conclude our series on the Katie Cabin 28 murders and dive into the darkness, one crime at a time. Welcome to One Crime at a Time. I'm your host, Shannon, and with me, as always, is my sister from the same, Mr. Christina. Hello. So, how's your week been? It's been okay. Work. Work. Yeah. Yeah. I was on vacation, so... Well, It I was still but, work. But I haven't really worked in five months, so I really can't <laughs> complain. <laughs> For real? <laughs> what are you complaining about? I go back to work tomorrow. <laughs> Um, I'm not looking forward to it, by the way. Well, we were working one, sometimes three days a week for five months. So not really, and only four hours a day, so. (sighs) Yeah, well, (laughs) I've got deadlines to deal with when I get back to work. It's going to be, it's just going to be so much fun. Yeah. I, I can hardly wait. I can't. Cont- I can. I can barely contain my anticipation. I can tell. I can tell. Of getting back to work. Woo. Okay, um, so this week we're going to um, pick back up on where we left off last week. But before we do that, I want to give some shout-outs. Uh, Catherine McLaren, thank you very much. Um, Tony Cricko, thank you. Diane Garrett, thank you very much. Mysterious Creature 576, thank you. I think I, th- I think I already thanked you, but thank you again because yes, apparently you, you um, gave us another shout out. So yes. thank you very much. <laughs> um, crime tri- and crime time traveler um, had a good conversation with her on Twitter the other day. So um, thank you for your kind words about our show. Appreciate it very much. Hope you continue to enjoy <laughs> it. And I got to thank my girl Desiree. Um, she's um, new patron on Patreon and. If you would like to help support the show, um, you can go to patreon.com slash onecrimepod. Um, check us out on there. There's three different levels depending on um, you know what you would like to give. Our new, um, our first mini-sode is up and available. So if you um, would like to listen to that, just go to Patreon, sign up, um, and you'll have access to that mini sode we have some um of course um exclusive material on there that's not posted on our social media um that deals with the first two cases that we've done so if you want access to that or would just like to give us a little bit of support that we would greatly 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 appreciate and you would yes. have our undying love and respect um you can do that um also um you could if you just uh, want to reach out to us we're on twitter Instagram and Facebook all at One Crime Pod um, or you can email us at one crime at a time at gmail.com um, and just a reminder that um, if you could please go um, give us a review, rate us um, subscribe on whatever um, platform you're listening to us on, we would greatly, greatly appreciate that. Before we get started, we need to talk to you about Audible I have used Audible for years, and I absolutely love it. Um, And it just keeps getting better and better. You can start listening with a 30-day Audible trial, and your first audiobook plus two Audible Originals are free. Um, And if you continue your subscription, each month you will continue to get one audiobook plus two Audible Originals that you can't hear anywhere else. Audible has bestsellers in business, self-improvement, memoirs, and more. Um, And they're professionally narrated. You're not going to get some joker like me trying to narrate a book for you. You're going to get a professional. 
<laughs> Audible also has a huge selection of true crime audio books. So my one crime at a time people out there, you don't have to worry. There's plenty out there for you. Um, like I said, I have used Audible for years and my library is pretty much all true crime. Um, and they have just a huge selection of it. Um, they also give you free access to the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post delivered daily to the Audible app. Um, and we all need, especially right now, you need to know what's going on in the world. So that's an easy way for you to keep up with things. And the thing about the app is you can access it anywhere. Um, at the gym, while you're commuting, at the office. Um, and the beauty of it is that well, no matter what device you use it on, it'll always pick up right where you left off. And if there's a month that you just can't decide what to listen to, you can roll your credits over for a whole year. So that gives you plenty of time to use those credits. So start listening and with a 30-day Audible trial by visiting audibletrial.com slash one crime. That's audibletrial.com slash one spelled out O-N-E-C-R-I-M-E. Audibletrial.com slash one crime. So with that being said, let's get back into our yes. story. And I promise, promise, promise that this is going to be the last episode. We're gonna wrap things up. Yes. Um because we just need to. We we we, we can't. Have... This can't go on forever. <laughs> I mean, because there's only it so could... much information. No, there is tons of information. But I, we could probably do a whole podcast no. based just on this case. Let's, yes, we. But let's, we're not going no. to. But I'm just saying <laughs> that 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 you could if you were so inclined. That's not what we want to do. So we're going no, to go ahead. And... There's other cases out there, <laughs> right? So we're going to wrap this up. This. This case is mind blowing, but um, so where we left off last week, um, they had discovered um Tina Sharp's remains. Um, it was in about fifty miles from Keddie and Feather Falls at Camp Eighteen, which was a Boy Scout camp. Um, the items found they found her skull, which had no damage to it. So the so we know that she wasn't killed by bludgeoning. Um, right. There was no damage to her head as was with the other victims. Right. Um, they found a piece of just red material. They're not sure what it was from. A piece of pink cloth that was described as belt-like material that was knotted in a loop. Um, they found part of a brown boot and a piece of white cord. Okay. Which, if you remember, that's what... The other victims had been tied with. Right. Now, whether she was tied with it, we don't know. Um, because, really, they only found her skull, some rib bones, I would, some vertebrae. I would venture to go out on a limb and say she probably was. I don't know. I mean, because it I just... Mean, you can't it does, prove it. We can't prove it. But I'm just... And there for are, me, right. For me, I'm saying that she was. Well, okay. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> um, there was also an empty tape container found by her body. Okay. Which I found interesting, since they were tied with tape. Yes. Too bad we couldn't go back and find out if that tape container was missing from cabin twenty-eight. Well, I mean, we don't. There was tape everywhere, so we but no, but there's no definite. Um, well, I'm just going, nobody knows for sure if the tape was brought. Well, into that's the bill. what I'm trying to say is because I'm still leaning there. back towards. The bathroom having the blood on the cabinet in the bathroom. My opinion is the tape came from inside cabin twenty. I would. That's what I'm. That's my. That's, that's my, my guess. opinion. Also, if if you were planning this, you wouldn't bring medical tape. No, you bring duct tape. You bring or duct something tape. like that. Yeah, right. That's not easily torn. And... Right. Um. Now, and when we had mentioned, um. I don't know if I mentioned this last week. I can't remember, but the, they received the phone call. The anonymous there was they received an anonymous phone call um, while they were trying to identify these remains. And um, everybody says that the phone call was made and told and identified the remains as Tina Sharp. And I'm pretty sure I mentioned this last week because I you said did. I was going to go find the actual quote from the tape um, because that's not what. The caller said they did not, because what Gambert said, 
he said that the caller identified the remains as Sheila Sharps, then hung up. But that's not how the call went. The caller said that, quote, I was watching the news about the discovery at Feather Falls, and I was wondering if they thought of the murder up in Keddie, up in Plumas County, a couple of years ago, where a 12-year-old girl was never found. Right. That's what they said. It's not me taking that. It's not. Them. That should, to me, I mean, I could be wrong, but to me, that's just somebody calling saying, hey, this might be this little girl. Right. That's how I took it, and I I think it's been misrepresented. I think so. By Gambert and other people um, who talk about this case. I think that's been a big misrepresentation. Yeah. Because the caller did not identify, did not say that Sheila Sharp's remains and then hang up the phone. Right. It was not a, a it was just saying, "Hey, have you thought about?" Now the police are convinced that this call did come from someone involved, have, and it, it may have, have. But I'm just saying that it's the been, actual call did not state that these people knew that it was right Tina's remains. Right. I don't know. I just I I just know that, I just think there's a lot of stuff that gets misrepresented in the, this the, case. The, yes, and that's one of them. Okay, so, um, like, we, like we'd said a couple of episodes back, in 2013, Sheriff Greg, Greg Hagwood um, brought in Mike Gamberg um, as a special investigator on this case. And like we had said, Gamberg had been a deputy from the Sheriff's Department. He had been fired a couple of times, um, and he had actually been fired, I think it was two weeks before these murders occurred. Okay. So, he did not work on this case. All right. Because he was not on the department. Okay. Um, now, both now Hagwood and Gambert both knew the victims because Hagwood actually went to school with um, Johnny and Dana. Okay. He was around their same age when the murders happened. And Gamberg, he actually had um, a son who was around the same age. And that kind of hung hung out with Dana, and he knew. Um, he said that he was friends with Marilyn, and that he knew Johnny and Dana both from school because he was a um, rest was their wrestling coach. Okay. Um. Anyway, he just claimed to know the victims very well, and he may have. I don't. I'm, I don't well, have any reason to something. doubt it. Yeah. Um. Small town, I would say. Yeah, I would say probably. probably. Yeah, that, you know. Um, Now, since 2013, they have discovered new evidence that supposedly nobody knew was there or that was being ignored or... Anyway, there's... They've claimed that they've discovered new evidence in this case. Okay. So, um, the first thing they found was the tape of the 911 call, which he said was in an envelope in a box that had never been opened. So, he, right. does, he doesn't think it had been analyzed or... Well, honestly, I don't really think there's a whole lot to that tape except for somebody calling in saying... Right. And the thing is, um, he's been saying for years that it's been being analyzed again because he thinks it's the voice of... One of the people that he thinks did it. Um, and he's, this has been going on, gosh, for years and years. And all he'll say about it is it's still being analyzed. Well, I don't think they found anything with it. Because it wouldn't have taken A voice years, recognition nowadays you know, would six not Six or seven take years. So I long. really don't think there's... I really don't think there's anything because to with that voice, tape. No, because with the voice recognition today, what they do is they put put it into a computer, Mm -hmm. the tape and the voice of the person that they assume, and it'll match it instantly Mm -hmm. if it's, if there's anything there. So no, it would not take. Yeah. Now he also said that he found a letter that was written from Marty to Marilyn um, a few days after, I wouldn't say, a little while after the murder, I think around the 16th, I think is when it was dated. April the 16th of 1981. Marilyn claims she never received this letter, but she did say that it's Marty's handwriting. Okay. For what it's worth for Marilyn. 
Um, but they're, what they've released of the letter, they've released the whole letter, but the, what gets pointed out is one line from this letter. And it states, that line says, I've paid the price for your love, and now that I've bought it with four people's lives, you tell me we are through. Great. What else do you want? So, when we talk about stuff being misrepresented, this is one of the big, big things. And we're going to go over this in a few minutes, but when we, because we're going to go through all the evidence that they have that they say shows that Marty and Bo are guilty. And this is a big, big, big part of it. But okay. we're going to go, we're going to go over this letter in a couple of minutes, but... They point out that one line, I've paid the price for your love, and now that I've bought it with four people's lives, you tell me I would want to read the whole letter because there's more to that. Bingo. So, they also found a report that Marty supposedly confessed to his therapist. He said that he killed Sue and Tina, but had nothing to do with killing the boys. Um... He said he killed them with a hammer. Um, so that's some new evidence they saw. Again, we're going to go over this in detail in a few minutes when we go over all the evidence they have against Marty and Bo. They also found a hammer that supposedly matched the description of the one Marty said that he couldn't find. Um, okay. It was found by a man with a metal detector near the pond in Keddie in 2016. Okay. They also found DNA on a piece of tape that was either found, that was either on Sue's mouth or by Sue's head. Nobody, because they haven't said, nobody has been able, they've said both. So it was either a piece of tape that was around Sue's mouth. It was somewhere around right, the vicinity or of her head. A piece of tape laying by her head. Now, um, that, according to Hagwood and Gambert, that DNA matched a living known suspect. Hagwood stated that they believe there are up to six people who were involved either in the crime or in the cover-up. So, I'm going to ask you, who do you think the DNA belonged to? I really don't know. I... Any guesses? I know who it's not. Who? It's not Marty and Bo. <laughs> well, bingo, because they're Marty both and Bo, dead. They're both dead. <laughs> so for it, it has to be somebody living because they said that it was I'm from a living I'm going to go out on a limb here and say it was somebody that was in that house that night. It was. I'll not the deceased either. No. Well, no, it wasn't. So we'll go over that in a minute. So, right, this is where we're going to start. This is all the evidence that they have against Marty and Bo that people state shows that they unequivocally committed these crimes. And then we're going to go through it. Okay, the first part, the first thing. People say that the sketches of the suspect look like Marty and Bo. Sort of. Well, I have I have seen the sketches, but I have not seen a picture of Marty and Bo, so I can't. I can, I can tell you right now, they don't look anything like okay, Marty and Bo. Okay, but I can't personally distinguish But let that. me tell you how people say that what you have to do to the sketches to make them look like Marty and well, Bo. Well, I can change things this in is my what mind they this to is, make this it is what on I the documentary. This is on the documentary. They, they claim that if you fold the sketches in half and put the top of one face... On the bottom of the other, it really? looks like Marty. Really? And that if you put the bottom of the one face on the top of the other, it looks like Bo. That is not evidence, people. No, that's just somebody <laughs> making something what they want it to be. And honestly, to me, the sketches look like the same person. With the different face, hair. With different hair, and one has a mustache. Other than that, they look exactly the same to yeah, me. Yeah, they do. I don't know if that is the sketch artist or if that was who was telling uh, them. Well, I mean, you know. But I've looked at the sketches and it, the features. They look alike. Are alike. Um, but folding a piece of paper <laughs> in half to make it come out to what you want it to be right. doesn't change the fact that that's, that's not what it is. It's not who it is. And I've got in my notes here I wrote down, are you serious? 
Are you serious? I can take a piece of paper and make it into a bird, but it's still a piece I mean, of paper. <laughs> it's just it's just ridiculous. Is I mean, what it is. That that's it's that is just ridiculous. This is okay. the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> so, and we're putting that through is it. So the second part. The hammer that was found in 2016 okay. that matches the description of the hammer Marty said he could not find. Okay, so this was found supposedly by a man who was who had attended attended a wedding at Keddy and someone had lost a wedding ring. So he was out there with a metal detector trying to find the wedding ring and supposedly found this hammer in the pond. But Instead of calling the police to say, hey, I found this hammer. It might have something to do with these murders. This guy writes a post on the Keddy28.com forum on the website stating that he found the hammer and didn't want to be identified. You wouldn't have to be identified anyway. So McNary calls Gamberg to tell him that about this post that some that someone put on his forum and Gambert said that when they went to retrieve the hammer the water was crystal clear as it always was and it didn't take them long to find it all he had to do he had a piece of cane and he just ran a piece of cane over the mud and there it was so this okay this hammer well, supposedly had been in crystal clear water where it was visible for thirty five years and nobody and nobody it. saw it. And not only the fact that you know, considering these companies that make these hammers want to make a profit, they probably made more than one. <laughs> Plus the guy goes on a website forum to Instead announce of calling the to announce that he found this and hammer. And not only that if they were at a wedding, why was he looking for a wedding ring out beside the pond? I don't know. This is, and then a few months ago, or it may have been, it may have been longer than that. Supposedly, why did this he have chip, a metal detector at a wedding? Is what? Well, I'm, no, he had come. He had supposedly went back oh, okay. with a metal detector to look for the wedding ring. It's that gold. Someone it lost. will shine in the sun. So I mean, I mean it, that part okay, but then supposedly. What came out was that this informant may have been someone that was in Bo's family. This stinks to high heaven, this whole hammer I don't think that's the hammer. I don't think it is either. I think that it's total BS because d What I think happened is... Marty's hammer did go missing, but you want my honest opinion? I think some of those kids got that hammer yes. and threw it in, threw it somewhere and lost it yes. or left it somewhere. That and it had nothing to do with the murders. That would have been 2016, and they were sent that for testing. That's been four years ago, and the, we've heard, not gonna we've find heard nothing about any evidence. Well, first found of all, even hammer. if it was the hammer, if it's been in that water for 30 years, ain't nothing else gonna be on that hammer. But well, first of all, in my honest opinion, that hammer was planted there. This was a setup. Because, yeah, because you're not. If that water it, is crystal clear and they checked all around. I don't believe the hammer. I don't only, believe that was a legitimate find. I not don't. only for that hammer, but for, but for Tina when they were searching for her, you know somebody looked over in that pond and would have seen that hammer laying there. Yeah, I mean, it's just. Because at that time. It wouldn't have been all rusty and would have been right. more I mean, it visible. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Um, okay, number three. Um, the claims that Marty and Bo left Keddy on Sunday, the day the bodies were found, in order to dump Tina's body. Okay, so most of these claims were made after the 2004 documentary when Glenna Meek stated that Marty was at her house the next night and had been in Reno all day. And um, the next day would have been Monday because the bodies were found on Sunday. And also, McNary, who runs Keddy28.com, he himself said that where Tina's body was found, it was a very remote location. He stated that he had studied the roads before going 
made maps, and he still got lost two times trying to go up there. Now, neither Marty nor Bo were local to that area, and I think that it would be very unlikely that an outsider would know where that place was no. and would be able just to find it if McNary um, they, well, couldn't if they find had it. A, if, if he got lost trying to find it, if they had have found it, they wouldn't have been back the next day because they would have been still trying to get out of the woods. <laughs> Now, and there, and McNary also claims that the finding of Tina's body was a setup because at the time that the body was found, Marty was supposedly living in Paradise, California when the right. body was found. But he wasn't living there when the body was dumped. So that, because he was living there in 1984, doesn't mean that he would have known where this place was in 1981. Right. In my opinion. Because he wasn't local. Him him, Norma were local to that area. No, they weren't. Okay, so now we're going to go over the love letter. So Marty supposedly confessed to the murders. Um, <laughs> and I find anyone that-, that reads this whole letter will see that it's painfully obvious that he's referring to his children because he had left his wife and kids to be with Marilyn. I was fixing to say, putting that one line out there, you can tell that there's more to what he's talking about. Well, this is what we're going to do because I don't know that this has ever been done, but I'm going to read this entire letter so that you can hear it and put it in context. Well, he, this is this is his letter. Dear Marilyn, first off, you know that I haven't tried to hurt you with my letters. I'm writing this after our phone call from Monday, April 27th. Marilyn, there's two things I want you to know. The first is that I love you and I don't care what has happened. Now is the time to start over. Call now. You don't know how much I have suffered before I met you. I asked God to send me someone who would care for me. I thought he sent you. I remember the hour, the words that were said, and I said your phone number a thousand times that night. I've given you my heart, all of it. Please try and think back. What do you think I've paid for you? For three years I've heard about your kids. Don't get me wrong, I love them too. Now I'll ask, what about mine? Don't you think I love them? Honey, I gave up four of the most precious things in my life for what? For you. The answer is simple. Now I'll ask you, why should I love your kids more than mine? I've tried. That's more than you can say. I don't think you ever loved me much less my kids, and yet you expect this from me, and I've given it to you. I've paid the price of your love, and now that I have bought it with four people's lives, you tell me we are through. Great. What else do you want? That's the part that everybody pulls out. I've paid the price. I've given my flesh and blood for you. I'll gladly pay your bills. Just send them in. You know that I love you more than my own kids. Can you say that? I know you have given up a lot to be with me, but I don't think you know what I've paid. Yes, I'm jealous. For the price I've paid, I should be. You can't seem to understand how bad you have hurt me. I'm crawling back. Take me. I've paid for your love. Please give it back at least once. If you don't, you know you've stolen my heart and given it to the street. I love you. Think about what I've given up for you. Marty, call me. That Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There was more That is to not that. a confession. He was not referring to killing four people. No. I can pull anything out of that letter and say this is what it means. Just right. one line and let that up be all people see. It's it's that's a, why that's why I told you when you read that I'm like there's more to that. Yes. And that is a big oh well he confessed in a letter. No he didn't. No. And if you anybody that reads it will know that. Yeah. But nobody takes the time to read it and the only part that they let you see is that one line. That's the one line they put out there. Right. He's given his he's paid it the price for with four lives. That's not what the letter says. No, it's not. Okay, so that's debunked. Now we're going to go over Marty's supposed confession to his therapist. Okay. Um this was not told to the um Plumas County Sheriff's Office firsthand. 
the, the reason this came up was they found a report where they had received um, information from a doctor who had a neighbor who was a therapist. Okay. And this neighbor told this doctor that he had a patient who had confessed to killing the people at Keddy. Okay. So the doctor who was the neighbor of the therapist, the therapist didn't call the authorities. The neighbor did. Okay. So, and the DOJ went and talked to this therapist. And apparently there was nothing to it because there was a follow-up report that was done. That And Josh Seabolt, who was one of the neighbors, actually okay. stated in a... Um, he had, he had written this article where he was talking about the murders. And he said that Hamburg let him see the follow-up report that um, debunks everything this therapist said in this in the um, documentary where he was talking to Josh Hancock about Marty confessing to him. Okay. Um, and pretty much what the therapist said was that he was told that... Um, that Marty had told him... Well, he never said that... Well, I guess he does in the documentary. He does state Marty by name. He says that he was told... He goes into this great big detail that Marty told him he had killed the two girls but didn't have anything to do with the guys. He said... The boys... He said that he had killed them both with a hammer, which we know is not true. No. Because based on the autopsy of Tina's remains, we know that she was not killed with a hammer. And Sue was not killed with a hammer. No. She was hit with a hammer after she was dead. But she was not killed with a hammer. I don't think... And, yeah, I know. And um, the therapist, first of all, didn't want to be identified. So his face is never shown. His name is never given. He didn't call the authorities at the time that it happened. And he should have, because at the time that this happened, Tina was still missing and no one knew where Tina was. So if this person had confessed to you that they knew that they had killed the little girl that you know is missing because it's all over the news in that area. Why aren't you calling the police? Because it's not true. Exactly. Exactly. And he's going, uh, supposedly... This 15 happened, minutes of fame. So, supposedly, he is going off of notes that had... Um, or not even notes, because the therapist was interviewed in 2000. That was in the 2010. So, it had been over 25 years since this confession had taken place. And the therapist himself stated that he didn't have access to any of his files or any of his notes from that time period because he was not working at the same place anymore. But yet, he's able to remember all these details off the top of his head that a patient told him 25 years ago that at the time didn't seem important enough for him to even call the police. Right. So, I don't believe that it... I don't believe it. I don't believe it either. And, and, um, like I said, that Josh... Seabolt had saw a report that was from the follow-up report with the DOJ. Because the DOJ did go talk to that therapist after his neighbor called him. Well, they had to. Because the neighbor called to report it. He didn't report it. Right. And then there's a follow-up report that Josh Seabolt says pretty much refutes everything that the therapist stated in the... Right. um, Well, none of the... In the the documentary. If you look back at how the victims were when they were found, none of them were actually killed with a hammer. No. They were hit with a hammer. Which Marty knew. And even if he did confess to that, there's two other people that confessed to this murder. It wasn't just Marty. Right. Even if it did happen that way. And the therapist himself even said that Marty had emotional issues, which he did. And he had some, he had issues. He was not a perfect person. Right. So even, I mean, that's not evidence. It's it's, it's it's hearsay. It's third person hearsay. Any therapist, when there's an ongoing investigation of murder, if one of their patients confesses to it, even if they think it's not true, they're going to call the police. If they think there's any validity to it. And a lot of people are like, well, he couldn't because of patient. No, that's not not, true. No, because when it's murder. That does not apply to if you think a, a person's life has been threatened a person's life is in danger or someone, someone has, has been murdered. murdered or bodily harm or anything like that. That does not apply. There is no patient-doctor 
contract confidentiality. No, when all that is happening. There's just not. And especially when there's an ongoing investigation of murder, if you have somebody confess, the first thing a therapist is going to do right, you go is call, call the police. Especially when you know you've got a 12-year-old girl My, that's still missing. And most of them are going to leave the patient in their office and go to another <laughs> office and call right then. Right. Okay, so that's that. Okay, um, the sixth thing, the statement that Marty made in his statement to the police where he stated that, talking about Justin, he's quiet enough to where he could have noticed something without me detecting him. Well, as we discussed last week when we were going over Marty's statement, that's taken out of context. It is. Because he had just been talking about Justin getting up at night when he stokes the fire. Right. And And I'm thinking he's saying sometimes I don't even know he's there. Right. That's what I think, too. I think that that's just a statement. They pulled that out, taken out of context. Of course. I like how they're pulling one lines out of things, getting people to believe that, okay, this is what he was talking about when there's so much more to all Right, when you go over the whole statement and read the whole thing, just like the letter. Right. Okay, so now we look at motive. This is the motive. This is what they say the motive was for Marty killing all these people. Um, That Sue had been interfering with Marty and Marilyn's marriage. she probably was. Which she probably was because Marty was an asshole. People do that. I'm not going to say Marty wasn't an asshole. He was an asshole. Now, but that don't ne- make him a killer. No, because there's actually never been any um, statements where he actually did anybody any bodily harm. Now, he was he yelled and pitched fits and was just a asshole sometimes. But there's never a re- there's not an, a record of him where, being violent. Of him being violent, um, as far as <laughs> physically towards someone. Right. But the thing was that he was saying that that Sue that Sue was supposedly telling Marilyn counseling her on that she should well, leave she had him been because things because, like right that. and that's what they say and the motive was that Marty was pissed off because well he probably was but my point on that is if there was anybody in that town in that area that was a threat to Marty and Marilyn's marriage it was Wade Meeks yeah because he was the one Marilyn was. Having the affair with. Right. If anybody I was a threat to the marriage, think, it was Wade. I don't think that Marty would have killed Sue for that because, I mean, pretty much everybody knew what she had been through with her ex husband. Right. The second motive was that because Marty just hated Johnny. <laughs> Nobody well, knows why. <laughs> sometimes people just hate people. <laughs> Nobody can say why. There are some people I don't like, but I don't kill them. <laughs> Nobody can say why he hated him, just because basically he hated teenagers. So I well, guess just this one teenager, he decided he didn't like enough to kill him. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. Now, I can kind of see his point there with some teenagers. <laughs> now, this is a thing, that this hasn't been out very long. This came out in 2017. Okay. And this is another fishy as hell shit that comes out. Don't none of these people. I don't think any. Of, I think they've gotten so twisted around that none of them Nobody know that you tweet no, this they don't. anymore. Honestly, they don't. The truth could the have truth. been found at first if they'd have worked it straight out, but they didn't. They well were, because every, nobody would tell them the truth. Everybody was nobody was telling them the total truth. That's wrong. Marty did. Well, <laughs> he's the only one. Truth. So do you think? That he's going to sit there and tell them the whole truth about everything. That's true. And him kill right. four people or two people. Is now, what supposedly. came out in 2017? Do you remember Kathy that um, Dana and Johnny stopped by her house to get a ride from? Yes, she wouldn't give them a and ride. She couldn't give them a ride because her mom had called her to go to dinner. Right. Well, supposedly Kathy and her mom had this mutual friend who was a bartender who they had called to give... Stick with me here. (laughs) That they had called to give them a ride because Kathy couldn't. Now, this bartender comes out... It's not even clear if the bartender said this or if it was a family member of the bartender that said this, that she was actually the one that gave them a ride home after she got off. Which So, if... Which... 
doesn't make sense because <laughs> because why would you be worried about if they got home or not when it's been hours since they've been at Kathy's house? It, it just doesn't make sense. And then in 1981, this is the bartender in the. I don't. This whole this whole story doesn't okay. make sense. My guess is, is the bartender was also working to what probably at, at least, least eleven thirty. At least ten eleven on a Saturday night. Then she would have had to have driven to Kathy's house, which we know they weren't that there. They weren't there, so she would have had to have driven around and found, found them, them. Which they no. wouldn't have been home by midnight. It doesn't make sense. So that wraps that. And then this bartender also claimed that Sue and Marty were having an affair. No. Not after that letter Marty wrote, I can tell you right now. He wasn't well, having, now, he had had affairs. He was he had cheated on Marilyn. He wasn't having an affair with Sue. <laughs> That's but Marilyn only... can't talk because she was cheating on him, too. She didn't even remember she had another son that was asleep in the bed when she went to the pub. Was the he? Lounge. Was he? Was he asleep in the bed? We don't know because nobody <laughs> knows where he was at. <laughs> there is no accounts of this child being anywhere. Well, yeah. I'm assuming. I think there's a good possibility he was at I'm Sue's assume, house. I'm assuming that this child was scared to death because his brother had tried to kill him. <laughs> well, that didn't happen until after <laughs> after the murders. But um, I just think it's very convenient how this bartender comes in and oh well and wraps this whole thing up because the whole this whole thirty something forty think... something years of this um murder case is the big contention has how did Johnny and Dana get they home? They got two legs, they can walk. <laughs> But that's been a big thing for all these years. And because then the conveniently last... in 2017, this is all wrapped up now. Okay, they got home, people are saying somewhere probably around 11, 30, 12 o'clock. Supposedly. The last account we have of them asking for a ride was at, what, 9, 40? Yeah, somewhere something. Along. They had plenty of time to walk to Caddy. They did. And if you remember... There's a witness named Frank that says that he saw three people walking by his house on their way to Caddy. That there were two shorter ones and a taller one in the back. Which we know Johnny was short because all of the sharp kids were kind of smaller for shorter, you know, smaller. Yeah. And, you know, it could have been them. It could have not been them. I don't know. I'm but just I'm saying just there's saying a possibility. They're wondering how they got home from the last account of somebody seeing them in Quincy to the time that they got home. They had plenty of time to walk that. Yeah, because it's five and a half, six miles. Yeah, from the that's Exxon, what I'm from saying. the Exxon to the that's what I'm to saying. their house. So I don't know. And so let's just move on to the next yes, piece please, of evidence. Just, I can't. <laughs> I just can't. Okay, so the next piece of evidence is that they say Marty and Bo worked to create an alibi, and they said that they and the they way they did this. Did. The way they did this was they wore the three-piece suits so that they would stand out at the bar. Or they were just trying to pick up girls. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, or they were celebrating because they had a big score on this scam they were running in Quincy. Yeah, I mean. Said they caused a scene over the music so that people would remember them being there. they that. First of all, there's no record of this in anybody's original statement that did not come out until... The 2004 documentary that there was a big scene in Marty's state In Marty's statement, he said that they left the bar because the music had been changed, and he called back. Now he didn't that's say there was a big Bo scene. Said. That's what Marty said. That's what Bo said, and that's what Marilyn said. When Marilyn, who was trying to convince everybody that Marty's guilty, didn't even, even, said. even said that all that happened was they went up to the bar and told them they were ready to leave, so they left. There was right. no mention of them causing a scene Who's in the bar. Who's saying that they caused a scene? Probably the woman they were yelling at for changing the music. <laughs> no. That came from Marilyn. Um, so, like I said, there's no record of that incident going down. And some have said that they got drunk, that they were sitting there, that they got mad at Sue because she wouldn't go to the bar with them and that they sat there and got drunk and that um, they kept drinking and the more they drank, the madder they got. So they decided to stop by and teach Sue a lesson. Well, first of all, if that's the case, how did they know that they needed to set up an alibi 
when they first went to the bar. Well, not if only they did, that. they got mad and got because they were not drunk. Not only that, not only that, but if Marty were upset with Sue for causing problems in his marriage, why would he? they suggest Marilyn ask her to go to the bar with him? To be with Bo. Right. And why would he want her to be with Bo if they were having an if she, if he was having an affair with Sue? See, I just debunked <laughs> the whole thing. There you go, done. Didn't so, happen. And um, so some have said that this that it was pre-planned, so that they knew they didn't know they needed to create an alibi. But that doesn't make sense because the weapons that were used. And the stuff that was used to commit these crimes were found uh, near about all of it was in the house. So right. if this was pre-planned, why would you not bring the stuff that you needed to commit this crime well, to he the took his hammer. crime Maybe scene? That's all he thought he would need. Well, I mean, the knives and the hammer, the electrical cord, definitely came from the house. Yeah, which would almost guarantee that since there was blood on the bathroom cabinet, that that tape came from the house, too. Right, and... Right, and the only knife that may have been used that didn't come from Cabin 28 was the Swiss Army knife. That and was any, found in the dumpster. And anybody, that's something people carried around in any way. Yeah, everybody so, had a Swiss Army knife. Um, And like we said, the tape may or may not have come from the house. It's never been determined with any type of certainty where it came from. It just does not appear that somebody came in there prepared, prepared to, to kill, kill people. somebody. Yeah. Now, the air rifle... Even Sheila and can't say whether or not it was in the house or not. She doesn't know if it belonged to Johnny or not, and nobody has said where. Who she it belonged wouldn't know to. if her brother had a gun or not. There's a lot of stuff that's. I mean, I mean, I'm okay. I will tell you, you live in the house with these now, people. Now she had only been there supposedly at Kitty for a month, but she had lived with them for years prior to that. Right. OnlineTherapy.com is not like other online therapy sites. The people at OnlineTherapy.com are a dedicated, online-based team of consultant therapists, cognitive behavioral therapists, practitioners, and support staff that work together to help people in need of emotional support. OnlineTherapy.com is not just chat. It's a complete toolbox. You will get all the support and tools you'll need to improve your mental well-being. Join now by following the link in our show notes and you'll receive a 20% discount. Be happier with OnlineTherapy.com. Jesus. So the next piece of evidence they have against Marty. Which is Bo. none because none of the, there's no evidence against them. Well, let me, let me go through okay, the list through of it, what people it, say. Go through it. Um, don't burst my bubble here Okay, so go through your evidence. <laughs> Um, they say that his friendship with Doug Thomas, who was sheriff at the time, um, that they were such good friends that Sheriff Thomas covered for him and destroyed evidence that pointed to him. Now, first of all, they were both outsiders to Keddie, to Plumas County. Neither one of them have lived there that long. And it's not like they grew up together. And I've got friends that I grew up with that if they killed somebody... I wouldn't no, cover for them. There's no way I'm covering for them. Mm-mm. They no. could not have been that close of friends. And even if they were, how could Marty have been sure that his friendship with Doug Thomas would assure his protection anyway? Because, I mean... Did he ask me beforehand, like, hey, if I murder Kill this woman and these gonna... three kids, you got my back, right? <laughs> I mean, I mean, this how could he have sheriff, known he that? He had worked in law enforcement, and I honestly believe that even if one of his childhood friends had killed somebody, he would not cover He's for not him. covering from some guy that he's not, he hasn't known that long. But he didn't have to destroy no evidence against Marty. Because, because there, there was, was none. none. Exactly. <laughs> so, the, t- the tenth piece of evidence that they have against Marty. Justin being in the house. They say that Justin being there was why the boys were unharmed. I don't think so. Well, if so, why didn't Justin name Marty and Bo as the killers? In all of his statements, he continually claimed to not know who the killers were, even under when he was supposedly under hypnosis. But if you the pictures, it looks just like them. 
And if he, if somebody would say, well, it's because he was afraid they had threatened him and told him no. Okay, well, that's not well and good. But if he if he didn't name them out of fear, then why hasn't he come out and named them After now that they they're died. both dead? Yeah, right. They've been dead, both of them, since, for 20 years now. Right. And he still refuses to say. And it's been said that he's gone back and forth on who it was. That he's told law enforcement, well, it was them, but it, no, it really was them. I don't I mean, think so. I think that's all BS. In my opinion, I just don't... I mean, I think somebody just didn't like Marty and Bo and they was just trying to frame them. Uh, Marilyn. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, that's just my opinion. So, since we're talking about Justin, let's go back to the DNA that was found. Okay. Would you like to guess now whose DNA it was? It wasn't her son's. No. It was Justin's. That's, yeah, but... So, Justin's DNA was found on the tape. Okay. That was either on Sue's mouth or laying by her head. We don't know which. Now, this is this came from Gamber. Now, whether he's lying, I don't know. But that's... He told... He has told two people that I know of, directly from his mouth, that this... That the DNA was Justin's. So, if people are right, and Marty did make Justin participate, and his motive for these murders was that Sue was trying to talk Marilyn into leaving him, then why didn't Marty use Justin's involvement as a way to blackmail Marilyn into staying with him? Marty had nothing Nothing. to do with these murders. (laughs) How many times have I got to say it? (laughs) I'm just pointing out what people are saying. Well, and then, I, I, and people are taking the easy way out and reading things into things that are not It's there. easy to do a frame around two people who are already dead. They can't sue you for liable. No. They can't, you know, I mean, they, 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 can't, they can't say they didn't do they it. They can't refute what you're saying because they're not here. It's easy to wrap this up. Supposedly, but then again, this has been going on. They've opened this in 2013. If they're so sure that these two men, why haven't? The, why not close the case? Well, why not close it back in the 80s if they were so sure it was? Leon? Well, they didn't. They weren't sure. None of this started coming up until 2004, when the documentary came out. That so the here's here's the thing for you. You know how I told you that Josh Hancock was prodded by a friend of his to look into this case. Would you like to know who that friend was? I'm guessing it was Justin. No. It was Sheila Sharp's cousin. Coincidence? I don't know. But this whole frame around, Marty died in 2000. They start this not long after that because the the documentary came out in 2004. Well, isn't that convenient so, that they would start getting everything together right after he died? That's what I'm saying. It's very convenient. That's my whole point. It, the evidence that you have read off to me that they have against those mm-hmm. two men... That's it. That's all the you evidence. took it to court, the you jury could, would laugh in your face. It would never go to court. It wouldn't pass... No. Muster for, I mean, it's the not DA evidence. The would not even indict them. Every bit of that is hearsay. If they were alive today and you took that to the DA and said, the, this is you the would, evidence. They would laugh at you. They would laugh at you. So what do you want me to do with this? <laughs> so that's, I don't, we're not talk, We're not going to discuss Bo and Marty no, anymore. No, because, because I it. think it's obvious that they. That, they had nothing to do with those murders. that's not where the answer to this mystery lies. It's just not. In my opinion, I don't think it holds up to scrutiny. No. But what I want to do right now, I want to talk about the condition of the bodies for a few minutes um, and then talk about a time of death of when these um, murders supposedly might have happened because nobody knows for absolute sure. But the uh, most law enforcement... And the medical examiner believed that between the hours of 11 and 2. Well, it would have had to have been after 11 because didn't the boys stay up watching TV till like 11 or so? No, they went to bed at 10. Okay. The boys and Tina, um, according to their statements, went to bed at around 10. And when they went to bed, Sue was still laying on the couch. Well, I'm guessing the murders didn't happen until after Johnny and Dana got home. Well, of course. 
they were last seen in Quincy at 9.45-ish. Yeah, somewhere around I think there. the last statement we have is around 10, 10.30. So, even but, if they those, got... But it, those statements are not very... Or from not really reliable. Yeah, but I mean, we're just... We're saying... They were seen around 10 o'clock yeah. in Quincy. And I want okay, to talk even about... Even if they'd have gotten a ride home, they would have had to have found one, which took no telling how long. Well, I we guess know that they, they, didn't been, get, they didn't get home till after 11 o'clock. Yeah, I think it was probably closer to 12 when they got home. Yeah. But I think that they're just putting in a... They're just putting they a can't, time, they can't, time They can't frame. really, yeah. Um, now, I want to talk about the bodies being moved and staged. Okay. Um, let's go over Dana first, because I think this is the most intriguing one. Um, there were actually, in the crime scene photos, um, they had cut out carpet under his body, where his body was found, because supposedly they had found shoe print, bloody shoe prints, under his body. Okay. Which means that... They were His body, body was, was moved not, there after... Yeah, now we don't have pictures of the footprints, but you can see, if you look closely at one of the photos... You can see what appears to be part of a waffle sold boot print by the cushion. Okay. We I'll know, have to go back and now we know photos. that Dana was wearing boots that had the waffle sold boot, yeah, yeah. boot print. So was it him that walked through the blood and put the shoe print there? It could have been. Now, here's another thing that's weird about this. The autopsy showed that Dana had to have been in a sitting position for at least two hours after he was dead because of the because of, of blood. The, because of the lividity right of his body right. Now he was not found sitting up. No. He was found laying on his stomach with his head on a cushion that was came, that came from the couch right. So that means he was dead for at least two hours before, before somebody put him. his body in that position. Why? Now, Johnny's body, I mean, the only thing you could really tell from his body was it looked like it had been rolled over onto his yeah, back. Yeah, because they've got it blurred, white it, it out. Just look, yeah, it looks like he was rolled over just from the way the, where the puddle of the blood was. Yeah, to and, where his body is. Yeah, it looks like he was rolled over on his back. Now, Sue, like we said in our first episode... Her body appeared to have been originally placed in a sexually explicit position with her legs spread. Um, and then the body was actually found laying on its side covered with a blanket. And we know that the blanket had to have put been put over the body before the body moved or was moved. Because we had said that maybe the body had just fallen over because it went into the body was in rigor mortis, so it went into rigor no, mortis. No, if you look at but the, the pictures, the, the blanket was placed perfectly over the body, so the body didn't move after the blanket. No, was No, that placed body there. was there before that blanket was placed. Right, on it. right. So I don't. Why are bodies being moved hours after the death? Who is moving? Are the killers staying around for two hours? They would have had to have. Why, though? What were they doing in those two hours? What were they doing? It's just a question. I don't have the answer. I don't have the answer of what they were doing. It's just a question. Because, obviously, these people were dead for at least two hours. Yeah. Before, well, one before, of this, them was. before the scene was staged. One of them was. And uh, that was uh, Dana. No, Sue had to have been two. Because her body had already entered rigor mortis. And well, that takes a couple to, of hours. She had to have been dead longer than two hours. Then. Well, it takes a, it can t- it, a couple hours it can start. Cause we were, we're it saying, can start, but if you think about it, it'll start, but the muscles will still move a little bit after two hours. Right, which is why I think that, that while we had said that maybe she had fallen over, her body had fallen over and then somebody came in and put the blanket over her then... So, my question is, why are these bodies being messed with two hours after they've been there I, dead? They're, I don't know. I'm, it's just a question I'm asking, just something to keep in mind. Well, see, I've thought of something, too, because 
you can't see in the crime scene photos, you can't see Johnny's head to know what anybody did to it after the fact that he was killed. Not in the ones we have. Not in the ones we have. But if you look at the ones of Dana, there's not a near enough blood on that couch cushion for him to have been bludgeoned to death while his head was on it. Yeah, there's not a lot of blood on it. It was and like was somebody head... was trying to care for them. Yes, exactly. Why was his head placed on a pillow? That's my point. It's like somebody was trying to care for them. Maybe not realizing they were dead. Which is sad because it could have been one of those little yeah, babies. Right. I don't know. I just find it weird because I don't know, because there wouldn't have been anywhere for Dana to be sitting up that he would have fallen no. over to be laying on his stomach. Now, there was a, what they call, I think it was a, I don't remember, it's this, it's the seat that, the phone table with the chair. Yeah. Um, They had one of those there, but it was on the other side of the room, because I was thinking, well, maybe if he was killed sitting in that seat, then maybe when his body started to go into rigor mortis or something, he had just fell forward. But when I looked at the crime scene photos, that's not possible because that chair was on the other side of the room from where he would have had to have been sitting to fall where his body was found. So that's not possible. Somebody moved him from a sitting that's position. That's what I'm saying. And like I said, I and can't where would see... he have been? Where where would he have been sitting up? There's no nothing on the walls to, um, no blood or anything, and enough blood to think that maybe his head was leaned against, like his he was sitting up against the wall. Right. Well, see, it just so I where wish... was where was he killed? Was he killed in the cat? I don't know. It's just questions. I'm just thinking out loud here. Um. I don't know, because, I mean, I wish that we could see Johnny's whole body in yeah. the crime scene photos to see how they staged it, because the other two, you can His tell... His was not as looked, much staged, I don't think. It just looked like he was just... Kind of rolled, rolled over, over. Like somebody had was checking, checking on see, him, yeah. is what it looked like. Like somebody was checking on him, and that's sad, because that's making me think it was one of those little babies. Yeah. I, I don't that's, know. That's breaking my heart. <laughs> I don't know, but it's because, and everybody was think saying that um, what had to have happened that Sue was the target and that the boys walked in on somebody attacking her. According to the evidence, that's not what. No, happened. they were all killed pretty close right there. It looked like because what it looks like, we know that Sue walked through blood. Yes. We know that the biggest part, that the most blood was around Johnny's head. Yes. Uh, and Sue's, but we know Sue didn't walk through her own blood because no. she couldn't have, after her throat was cut, she wouldn't have been walking around. And Dana, there was really not enough blood there for it to seep up. If she had stepped in it, for it to seep up through her toes and everywhere. Right. I think what happened from what the evidence shows was Sue had gone to bed yes. and heard something going on and then came in the living room and walked into whatever was happening. Yes. And I think she probably walked over to Johnny's body, stepped in the blood. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe she's the one that, that rolled, rolled his, body, rolled his body, body over. She could have been. But the whole scenario of the two boys coming in and walking in. It's not you know, possible. It's... It, that's just not what the evidence shows, no. in my opinion. Um, and mm-hmm. it's, I think that the bodies were staged the way they were. I, th- I mean, honestly, I've tried to go over this and over this and over this. And it just seems to me that this re- revolves around Tina. It, and the, Because there was some reason. I'm not saying she killed him. No, okay, I mean, no. I'm not... But there is some reason why she was not wanting to stay at the neighbor's house there was when a reason. she had done it every time, every Saturday since they'd been there. Right. Um, I mean, I just feel like, and I feel like that may be one of the reasons the bodies were 
laid that way to kind of stage it to where they that maybe to make Tina just an afterthought right for a reason I don't know it's just me I'm just really just thinking out loud right now but what we, I, well, I guess what we need to do now we'll go over some other suspects and theories okay. about what may have happened um, the first people I want to talk about are the Meeks family okay um as far as now, as you know, they were they were supposedly the Sharps' best friends. Mm-hmm. Um, now, Richard and Sheila had a baby together, right? And it is known that the Meeks family was not happy at all about Sue sending Sheila off to have the baby and giving it up for adoption. Okay. Clara Meeks wanted to keep that baby. Well, they should have had some say so. Well, I mean. I can understand Sue's point. I can Sue understand had, Sue, but Sue already had five kids that she was struggling to take care of. Glenna Meeks was a single mom. She had seven kids that she was already struggling to take care I of. I can see her point, but I can also see the other woman's point. Well, I can too. too. I'm just looking for reasons that maybe they were upset. Now, I don't know how upset they would have been. I don't know because you know the morning that Saturday morning. Sue went to the Meeks residence. Right. And, but Sheila left. So it was just really Sue and Glenna. Right. So were they having a discussion about it? Were they arguing over it? Had it already been settled since Sheila had been back since, what, February, I think? End of, where she had the baby in February. I think she'd been back for a month or so. Right. So was that already settled and everything was fine? Who knows? Because you're not going to get the truth out of that. I mean, even if they say it was, you don't know for sure. But um, what bothers me about the whole Meek situation is Wade's movements the night of that Saturday night of April the 11th. And who he was with and statements that were made by the the people he was with. Okay. Um, So... What they said was the night, that night, that him, Philip Shearer, and Blaine Gruber, they had gone to the college for some square dancing classes. (laughs) And that um, they had left around 8.45 to 9. And that Wade's story is that he dropped Philip off at the Methodist Church. Okay. Which means that he would have had to go by the Exxon station. Right. And that he went home and then went to play cards at the neighbor's house and didn't get home till around 1 or 2 the next morning. Okay. Now, this Philip Shearer that he was with, on April the 2nd, he had been um, arrested for for crawling in a young girl's window and attempting to rape her. Okay. And what... Is had not been known until um, probably a few years ago. The Meeks didn't mention this. Was Philip Shearer was actually the Meeks' cousin. Okay. Um, Glenna's sister had adopted him, and nobody knew this for years. And that the Meeks didn't tell anybody this. Okay. It actually came out on one of the forums from some research that one of that somebody had done online. And a few days after the murders, Philip was in the police station with his mom. Um, they were sitting there. I'm assuming he was being questioned for something concerning the um, attempted rape charge. But there was a um, guy, an officer working the desk. And he overheard a conversation that Philip was having with his mother. Okay. And he was telling her that he was there at the night of the Keddie murders. That he was at Keddie in the house the night of the murders. And he said that... And his mom and the officer that was working the desk kept saying, you know, his mom was telling him, you know, hush, don't be talking about that. You weren't there. He only heard parts of the conversation, really, because he was having to answer phones and stuff like that. So... Um, they questioned Philip about this. And he said that that night that he was drunk so that 
Wade had dropped him off at the Methodist Church around 9 o'clock. Okay. Um, he said after being there for an undetermined amount of time, he decided to go to the Exxon where he met up with Johnny and Dana. Okay. Who were there. Um, he said they were getting a ride from three people in a pickup truck. And the pickup was described um, as between 1954 to 1957 dark green Chevy. Okay. And it had something like a roll bar in the back. Now, he said that the man driving was Marty. Okay. But first of all, Marty didn't have a truck. He didn't even have a running vehicle. Right. And we know, I mean, and at this time, he was at the house getting ready to go to the bar with Marilyn and Bo. Right. And I think that probably Philip, because I think Philip had, he was kind of, he had a mental disability also. And I think that he had been maybe hearing things at the Meeks house since Marilyn and Justin were staying at the Meeks house. Right. And I'm sure we're talking about things that went on and we're blaming Marty for it. Right. Because that was Marilyn's stance was Marty was guilty of these murders. Right. And that, um, he said that after arriving at Caddy, that he was looking through the window of the Sharp residence, he saw Johnny get his throat cut, he saw Dana get hit over the head with a hammer, and he saw Sue being choked. Phillips said that at one point he ran to the Caddy back door bar where he saw a man that was locking up the bar. He tried to tell the man what was happening, but the man got into a blue car that looked like a Mercedes and drove away. He said Philip then returned, or Philip said he then returned to the Sharp residence to try to help Tina. And at one time he was hiding under the house and he scratched the license number from the pickup onto the hot water heater. Philip took a long fight. Philip told of a long fight that ended up at. Ganser Airport where he got away and that the three men still had Tina. So I guess he was saying that he had fought these three men that were taking Tina. Right. And for some reason they ended up at the airport, which doesn't make sense. Um, also, the guy that owned the um, bar said that um, he didn't um, recall anybody coming up to him when he was closing asking for anything. The reason this just intrigues me a little bit is because I think there's some parts of this that maybe be getting mixed up because one thing is we know that he dropped, we know that Wade dropped Philip off right. at the Methodist Church supposedly. <laughs> that would have meant that he had he rode by the Exxon station where we know Johnny and Dana were at about that time. Right. We all, when Wade was asked about it, he said, I didn't even see them, let alone talk to them. That was his answer, which implies to me that he probably did talk to them. Yeah. And doesn't want to say so. And what if he it, what if he what if Philip was with him at the Exxon station saw Johnny and Dana mm-hmm. Wade told them that he would give them a ride but he had to take Blaine home right and so what if he stopped by the house and that's how Glenna Meeks knew that Johnny and Dana would be home soon because nine o'clock is right around the time that Ricky said Sue got a phone call from Glenna Meeks stating that Johnny and Dana would be right. home in a little while. Right. Is that because Wade had told them that he would give them a ride home as soon as he dropped Blaine off? Could be. And did he? He could have. Did he go back and get... Did he and some of his brothers go home and get give them a ride home? It's just a question. I don't know. I just find it suspicious that... At around the time that he was, that Wade supposedly gets home is when Sue supposedly got the phone call from Glenna Meek stating that Johnny and Dana would be home soon. How would she have known that? Right. Just a question. Just a question. <laughs> and also, I mean, Glenna Meeks, 
I don't know if she's just confused about what she has said in the past or but she's told some some tales. Right. And I don't know if it's just misremembering or if she had was if or if she was flat out lying. She I don't had know. Seven kids. She could have been crazy. <laughs> Or if she was like, or if she believed Marilyn that Marty was guilty, so she was doing whatever she could to point them in Marty's direction to right. either to either a protect her own kids or to assure that whoever killed her friend got arrested for it. Right. But she had told this, that story in the documentary about Marty um, coming to her house after being in Reno all day and stating that. Um, he had she was kind of acting crazy talking about I gotta get back to Keddy I gotta get back to Keddy there's something there I started that I got to go finish well this statement was never made to the police this was a state this was something that just came up in that documentary like a whole lot of stuff that just happened to come up in that 2004 documentary that supposedly pointed to Marty and Bo I don't know that that incident ever even happened. Well, people did take a lot of drugs back then, too. I mean, I'm just saying. I just don't... I just find... I just find it odd that all this stuff comes up years later that was never mentioned to investigators in 1981. Because none of this happened in 1981. That's what I think, too. And they're just saying it now. Then she had a story... Of an ex of hers named Jim. Now nobody has can find out who this Jim was. There's no record of him being. Nobody else mentions this ex being around. But she claims that she had driven to go pick him up and brought him to Quincy, and that it just so happened that the day um, the bodies were found, or the day after the bodies, or the day the day that the bodies were found, I think is her story. That this ex of hers named Jim and Marty went to cut wood in the rain, mind you. Even though that day it wasn't raining. But she said that it was storming that day. But Mr. Seabolt went to cut wood, too. So that Marty and this Jim guy went to cut wood in, uh, in the rain, even though we know it was not raining that day. And that they built a fire in the rain so that Marty could burn his bloody shoes that had blood all over them. Again, this was never mentioned in Well, apparently one of them had a fireplace, right? If they were cutting wood. Why not just take them home and burn them in the fireplace? I don't know. I mean, Because Marilyn said that she woke up in the middle of the night and saw Marty burning something in the fire, in, in the wood stove. It could have been which, wood. But we, we didn't. But again, it was not mentioned in her statement she, in 1981. Okay, she also stated that that was around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, which he had already stated to the police that that's what time he got up every morning and... Well, she never fire. mentioned that part. That part's back totally then, made up. Just like then. all this other stuff is totally made up. Yeah. To point the finger at Marty. Well, that's what I'm saying is, is she's taking his statement from the police and saying, well, I got up when he did and saw him burning yeah. something. That's what I'm saying. And then, she, and then Glenn Meats <laughs> claims that she never called Sue that night. And here, I don't know who to believe. Do I believe... Glenna Meeks, who I know has told some other untrue stuff that, that wasn't very accurate. Or it. do I not believe Ricky, who was ten years old at the house? I don't know. But why would why that would child he why lie would about what that? motive would Ricky have for saying that? Right, because that okay, let's just say that that ten year old Ricky did even kill all four of them. Yeah. Him saying that Glenna Meeks called is not gonna I just don't understand what would be his. What would be the reason for him making Even that up? Even if he up? had have killed him, there would be no reason not to lie about that. Yeah, I just, I, I, I can't think of a reason for him to make that up for the. To I'm be not part saying of the story. he did kill him. Unless them. he knew that it was the Meeks boys that did it, and he was trying to tell that without telling that. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud here. I don't either. Um. I don't know. And I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to go through all of these other suspects, but I don't know who did this. 
I know it wasn't Marty. I know who didn't do it. Don't, Marty I don't, and Bo did not I don't, kill those people. Based on the evidence that they have, if that's all the evidence they have, Marty and Bo could have done it. I don't know. But based on what they have as evidence, they didn't. I honestly don't think they did. Yeah, I, I don't. Honestly, I don't know. If, I don't see why they would. I don't see a clear motive. Of uh, well, I mean, people are saying he was mad at her, but then he's going to turn around and ask her to go to the bar with him, so Bo wouldn't be. Able, I mean, none of that makes sense. It doesn't, it doesn't sense. make sense. And if they were together, and if he's this jealous guy. Who's he crazy? Want her to be Why would Bo? he want her to be with another man right in front of him? That doesn't make sense. This is giving me a headache. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's just move on. We're going to talk about two cats named Chuck Walkie and Henry Thomas Thompson. Excuse me. Okay. Now Henry, he was the older brother of Alice, who is the same Alice that Sheila had went to visit. The morning that they all went to town, the morning that Saturday morning when okay when okay. Sue took the kids to ball practice and she had gone to the Meeks and Sheila had walked to her friend's house. Alice, okay, uh, this, that's I Henry's. remember Alice okay. now. Okay, so that's Henry's younger sister. Um, now Chuck he worked with the Forestry Service and he happened to have a brother Carrie who was a con- who was a convicted pedophile. Um, okay. Chuck, working with the Forestry Service, wouldn't know where Camp 18 was. Yeah. He would know, you know, how all, all of that area. And how to get around through there. Right. Now, their story um, about the murders, this is, parts of it, you can jive with each other and parts of it don't. Okay. But what they said was that, um, this, I guess I'll do, let's do Chuck's statement first. Okay. Um, he said that um, they had been in Livermore, that him and Henry Thompson had been in Livermore, um, that they had gone on Henry's red Chevy truck. Um, it was a small model, like a love, not yeah. you know, a little Chevy love. Um, they had left um, Livermore around, around 11.30, um, headed to Quincy. He said they arrived at the Caddy Turnoff at around 3.30, that morning. Um, and Henry said he wanted to see if a friend in Caddy was going to work the following Monday. And they were going to ask him that and go by and see if he was still up. Which doesn't make sense. Why would you, at 3.30 in the morning. Didn't why these would people you, have telephones? Why would you go? I mean, the telephone was invented in 1876. <laughs> but these people use all this gas driving <laughs> all these places to see if somebody's going to go to work well, Monday. Why would you go by somebody's house at 3.30 in the morning to see if they're going to be at work on Monday? Yeah, that don't. doesn't make sense. So, they are, they uh, they go pull into Caddy. Um, they drive into Ketty, and Henry drove by his friend's home and saw that he was not up, so he didn't stop. Well, duh. It was 3.30 And the then morning. they came out, and, took, and Henry took Chuck home. Now, Chuck was asked if he saw anything in the area unusual, and he said that he did see um, a pickup truck parked at the turnoff in front of the old gas station, which would be the general store. Chuck said that the truck was a solid dark color and was probably around a 1975 model. Okay. He couldn't tell what type of truck it was, but thought that it was a Ford or a Chevy. Chuck said that there were two men at the rear of the truck, and as they drove by, he saw them walking toward the doors to get in the truck. He noticed the driver better than the passenger as the truck was parked in a position that he could that he could see the driver best. Right. Um, he said that the two men could have been putting something in the rear of the truck when he first observed them, but he could not be sure. He said the two men looked similar to the composite drawings he saw in the newspaper and that the hair was about the same as well as the general build. And the driver was wearing dark sunglasses. Okay. Um, the driver also At had a checkered. In the morning. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know that's how Justin described them. They wore sunglasses. Um, he said and the driver also had a checkered type short sleeve shirt and Levi's and possibly boots. He also had a splotch or spot of something on his left arm, just below the shoulder and above the elbow. He said that both men had short sleeve shirts on. He said on the way out of Keddie. 
that he did not see, um, that he said that he saw that when they were coming into Caddy, but on the way out, that the truck was gone. And they, they, were were at the, they were at the service station. Yeah. yeah. Which is where all the Swiss Army knife yes. and the bloody stuff and all that was yes. found in the dumpster yes. behind. Okay. Yes. I'm just trying to get my bearings straight. Here. Yes. Um, so, um, <laughs> he said that he didn't see anything else that he recalls. So, Henry's statement is that they had gone to Livermore to visit friends of Chuck's and that on the way back to Quincy, they stopped at Keddy because Henry wanted to see his brother-in-law who lived there, supposedly. He said that they drove his 1978 Toyota pickup and they arrived in Keddy around 4 o'clock. Okay. Which is about thirty minutes off. Yeah, from I mean three thirty. I can see the. I mean, that's all. It's not like it's hours. It's yeah. Henry said that he was certain that they did not see anyone on Highway seventy around the old service station, and they continued into Keddie to his brother-in-law's house, where they pulled into the driveway for a few seconds. He noticed that it, that it did not appear that anyone was up, so he drove out. He says on the way out of Keddie, he noticed the vehicle that Chuck was talking about and that it was parked facing the street in the driveway next to the Keddie store in front of the garbage bins. He also said he was sure the vehicle um, was a pickup and that it was white or light colored. He saw one of one subject next to the pickup outside. He said he thought maybe the subject was dumping garbage. He said they continued out of Caddy and that he took Chuck home and then returned home himself. So he was then asked um, who his brother-in-law was, and he said that it was Tom Schmidt, who, if you remember, is the guy that lives right behind the Sharps' house. Yes. Who was the one that came home and saw the someone washing dishes through the window. Right. So that's the that's Henry's ex-brother-in-law. Right. Um, he was asked if he knew um, the Sharps or Wingate, and he said that he went to school with Wingate, but he was older than Dana, but that he knew him, but that he didn't know the Sharps. Um, he was asked about the discrepancies. Um, the discrepancies in those two stories, those those are minor. Well, one says that they saw this truck with two people, Go when they were going into Caddy, one of them says that they saw a different, a lighter colored truck with one person when they were coming out of Caddy. But there could have been two people. Was, that's my that whole truck. point. Was it two different vehicles? But there could have been two people around that truck that he saw coming out of Caddy, but you just couldn't see. But did one he not steady. notice the person? The, did, did he not notice the truck? Because Chuck says it was a green truck. Maybe he just didn't notice it. I don't know. Or maybe they're... But, and another thing is going into Caddy. You said truck, Chuck was driving, right? No, Henry's driving. Well, Chuck may have seen it since he was able to look more. Mm-hmm. And Henry was driving watching the road. Because nowhere on there did they say that it was parked on the road. It was just parked there in a way that he could see the driver better. Yeah. Um... So he may not have been paying attention. Well, my thing is, they both put themselves in Kitty around 3.34 o'clock. Um, and I think they did see a truck there. And I think that they're saying, that, well, we need to say that we need to tell the cops if we're asked. Because they thought probably they were seen. And somebody would recognize his red Toyota truck. So... For since they thought they were seen, then they had to include that part in their story, and maybe they just didn't get it exactly the same and tell it exactly the same. I don't know. I just find it odd that well, you would now, go. Well, now I could see where he might not see that truck going in if he's driving, but if he's coming out, he would see a white colored truck. Maybe that white colored truck person was just dumping garbage, and the first truck was actually dumping something else. Or vice versa. Who knows? I don't know. I just find it weird, a strange story, that you would um, 
stop by somebody's house at three well, or four o'clock that's a little in the morning too, but to ask them if they're going to be at work on Monday. Well, I find that a little strange too, but and here's some more information for you. Apparently, Henry um, told the um, investigators that he didn't know the Sharps, but Alice, his sister, said that he did know um, Johnny and Sh- um, Johnny and Sheila. Well, maybe- but he didn't know them very well. But he didn't know who they were and knew well, them well, because but that they- was her. But they asked, "Did you know the Sharps?" Well, I mean, he knew who t- he knew Johnny and Sheila and who they were. I mean, they weren't best friends or close or anything, but he knew who they were. But well, I mean, I could see where. I'm not saying that he's innocent, but yeah, I can see I where mean, that could be. I'm just trying to point out. I, I can mean, maybe see where he, that could be taken out of context because if they right. ask, "Do you know them?" I would say if I did, if I just knew who they were and knew one was a friend of my sister's. I would say, well, no, not really. Right. You know? Well, old Henry, he actually confessed to his roommate that him and his... How many confessions are we going to have in this I told you that there were two other people that confessed to this besides... If if Marty did, which I don't believe he did. But there's two other people that did confess. Now, Henry confessed to his roommate that... um, that it's what this is what he said. Um, the railroad worker was in Livermore, and that another the railroad worker, by the way, is Henry. He worked for the railroad. He had a roommate, um, and that um, the roommate is the one that called the police to tell him what Henry had told him. He said that what he said was that he had been in Livermore, and that another man named Larry or Jerry or Gary. A related name gave the railroad worker a ride to Caddy from Livermore the night of the murders. Okay. Um, apparently, there was a party going on in Te- in Caddy that involved the use of LSD. He said that Henry and the subject that gave him the ride then went to the Sharp House where they started playing a game with the victims, and the subject that gave the railroad worker a ride tied up the victims. Okay. Um, and he didn't have any further information on that. I guess that was all he told him. And so they went and asked Henry about all of this. And he said that, yes, he did tell his roommate this story that him and another guy were responsible for the murders. But he said that he only told him that because he was tired of people calling. Because apparently they, all of his co-workers and friends and guys that were messing with him had been calling him the Keddy Machete. Because okay. apparently it had gotten around that him and another guy were responsible for the murders. Right. And so he said that he told this story because he was tired of people picking on him about being the murderer. That doesn't make sense to me. And why were people calling him the would, petty machete? Like, why make, did it get okay. out that he was that he may be involved? It would make sense if they were in second grade. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because well, think about it, kids do things like that. I don't know. I just don't know why. So I could see a kid being called names and say, "Well, you know what? Yeah, I did do it." You know. <laughs> I mean, but why? I mean, where did it come from? Why did it get started that Henry's nickname was the Kitty Machete? Well, he did put himself in Kitty. Maybe that's why. Maybe he was t- going around telling the story. Well, I was there. I saw this. So maybe I don't know how that got started. But that's the the reason that he gave that he. Um, but decided- in that statement that that roommate gave, he never said anything about him killing him. No, they he just, just tied them up. Tied them up and went and started maybe that as a made game. It easier for the killer to come in and <laughs> slash <laughs> their throats. <laughs> so, <laughs> so really, only Henry's only part in this was Is he tied. He's not. He he watched somebody tie them up, and and then they left. And then they left. And then two more people came in, and or at them. least one other person came. Well, in. Well, they were already tied up, so it would only take one. <laughs> right. They wouldn't have to overpower anybody. Right. True, except you know, yeah, except for Sue because she did. Ha- she's the one that had the. Well, maybe. Well, this is true. The, but Sue um, was 
So it, what if it, you know, yeah, one person versus three. <laughs> I mean, because they're tied up. Sue was the only one that had defensive ones. Now there was that's a- why because the other two were tied up. Before. Johnny and Dana did not, which I find because they were already tied up before they were killed during the game. Yes, I don't know what kind of game this was. I didn't play this game, don't but I was just know what kind of game this was. <laughs> I never played this game. We will not talk about this game, but it was a game. (laughs) This is not that kind of podcast. (laughs) No, that's the other podcast. No, I'm just playing. Um, So, I don't know. I mean, I could probably put a better... um, I could have come up with a better story than... Yeah, and it just seems... Their story doesn't (laughs) make sense of why they would... And it just so happens that the house that they go to is the one that's right behind cabin 28. Well, they could, again, now, I'm, I'm saying this with all due respect. <laughs> you don't have to. Does that mean that you can say whatever you want to say? No. <laughs> but a lot you... of people, not necessarily these, but a lot of people did a lot of bad drugs back then. Oh yeah, everybody was. There. I mean, that's so safe. I'm thinking full that drugs. maybe they don't really remember what happened. Some of them, not necessarily these, but some of them, maybe. I don't know. It just seems weird. The whole story of going to find out if somebody's going to be at work on Monday well, at three thirty in the morning, drunk or high. That I would think, seem like a good idea. I think that there was another reason they were in Kitty that they night. They were playing and a game wanting... and tying people up. <laughs> it was either that or they were at some kind of party, drug party, that they didn't want to tell the cops that was the reason they were there. But you would tell somebody that you tied two people up during a game? That He didn't tell. I mean, he just was telling oh, that's that that's right. To... He watched somebody tie somebody up. Yeah, and I mean, that was just, he said that it was just so, so that just people would leave him alone. And all of this. So I guess he's trying to scare people into thinking that he is really the Kitty Machete and that they need to stop talking bad about him or he's gonna tie them, do, up. Tie them up. Or he's gonna get that same person and watch him tie them up. <laughs> I mean, I could have come up with a better story than that. <laughs> I just find it weird. I, I, can, I find their whole statement weird. Were just, they even in Kitty that night? I think they were in Kitty that night. And I think they did see somebody by the dumpster. Now, whether it was themselves by the dumpster <laughs> or they thought that somebody, they that there was somebody by the dumpster and they were seen, so they had they made sure that they included that in their um, statement I, I, to the police. You know, I don't know. I'm just going over people that are... You know, because that had opportunity. Well, everybody in Keddy had an opportunity. True. You know, people go out at five in the morning to go cut wood. Well, we're about to go over that. Um, I just there's a lot, and, and I'm in no way saying that any of these people are guilty of this. Me either. No, me either. But there's just a lot of people that had the opportunity. To do this. Right. Not saying they did, but if you look at everybody's stories, there's a lot of people that had an opportunity to do it. Yeah. Except for Marty and Bo, because we know they they were at. Well, they had opportunity. They had the opportunity. I just don't think that they did did it, but they had opportunity. They're the only one. Well, Bo did lie to the police, but only because he didn't want to get caught doing his scams. (laughs) But they're the only two, really, that did not lie to the police. Uh, and change no. their story. Well, true, but I mean, we know that Bo lied. We know Bo lied, team. but it was because he but not about it. that night. Not about that night. Yeah, not um, about those murders right. and all that situation. He lied about the scams and all that, and but not about these murders. Right. So the next person we can go over is James Seabolt Senior. Yes, please let's go over. And this. I'm not saying I just like I said I'm just pointing out things that seem strange. Yes. And I'm sure there may be a perfectly reasonable explanation for all of this. But 
and it and it really doesn't if you if you agree with the timeline of when they say these murders happened or between eleven and two, it really doesn't line up with what with his story. But what? now, if you believe Chuck and Henry, they saw somebody at the dumpster, um, cleaning out supposedly dumping some something in the truck. It could have it that more than likely was James Seinbold. It would have been anywhere. It would have been anywhere from because Chuck says they got there at three thirty, between three thirty and four. Let's just say right. That if all they did was if what they said they did, if they drove in to Caddy, drove in a drive, sat in a driveway, didn't notice any lights on, backed out, maybe t- ten minutes at the most. Right. So you got to say this was anywhere between three thirty and four ten. Yes. That they saw this truck. So that's earlier than when when he told Shaver he left to go cut wood because he said he left around 5 a.m. Now, but it could be... nobody can confirm that. Right. And it could be that Chuck and Henry, it wasn't... Seabolt that they well, saw I'm, I'm not truck. saying it was but because they, even their descriptions of the truck don't match don't line up there's just so much in this where people aren't I mean it's like every time you to ask somebody they ask somebody a, a question or each time somebody gives a statement that person's statement is different right and I don't understand why why there is a reason that Tina was not in that Seabolt residence on that night. When she had stayed was there. Was there a plan for her not to be there? Was it because she didn't want to be there? We know that, you know, I brought up that maybe one of the reasons that Sheila didn't want Tina staying there that night. Maybe it was because they wanted to sneak out because Alicia was seeing Dana. She had started seeing Dana that week. Did Sheila? And, um... But wouldn't Tina have known anyway? Well, not necessarily. Well, Dana was at her, their house. Right, but, but she, she, had was supposed, she had supposedly gone to bed already. What if Sheila and Alicia did sneak out and went... To Sheila's house. Okay. Dana and Johnny are there. So that they... So that the kids can... Just be together. Can have their time. Sue goes to bed. Right. Leaves them all in the living room. What... Now we know that Dana's pants were... Unzipped and unbuttoned. Right. What if it so happened that maybe Mr. Seabolt discovered that... They had snuck out, went over there, and caught them. Caught Alicia with Dana. Could or be. some scenario like that. Could be. I'm just throwing stuff out there. I have no way of knowing if that's even a possibility. There's a reason that Johnny's... I mean, that Dana's pants were unzipped yeah. and unbuttoned. That's one possibility. Another possibility could be that it was a drug thing and that Dana... Because we, I, <clears throat> I know everybody thinks in the movies, you know, if you're wearing a wire, that it's going to be up on your chest. Well, that's not where they not do it. They do it below your waist because yeah. that's because they think that that'll be the last place somebody looks for a wire. Maybe somebody thought he was snitching, as being a snitch. Could be. Maybe it's a drug deal. Maybe it's a drug thing. Maybe they took him there to confront him. About being a snitch. And they looked to see if he was wearing a wire below his waist. I mean, I'm just trying to think of reasons why his pants would be unzipped and unbuttoned. There's so many reasons. Maybe he was in the bathroom when whoever came in came in. And he just didn't zip and button I mean, maybe it could be as simple as that. I'm just or maybe throwing... he was getting ready for bed and somebody came in. And I mean, there's so many reasons right. <laughs> why his pants could have been unbuttoned. Right. Or yeah, I'm just. Those are all reasons. And the th- thing about this case is, we're never going to know. No, because the people who know are not going to talk. Are not talking. 
And um, and there's several people that know what happened. I can tell you that right yeah, now. Yeah, I mean, and here's an interesting thing. Um, Joel Lipsy, he was the special education teacher that came to police stating, you know, that Sheila was, you know, overly friendly and right. was always, you know, being overly affectionate with him. The one who had pictures of her in his house and all. Hmm. Now, John Douglas, who is the famed FBI profiler, he right. did a profile on this case without okay. knowing all he all he looked at was the crime scene. He didn't know. Well, any that's of what them. they do. Right. They don't look at all the. Now rest he of it. said in his um, profile that Tina was the focus of this. Crime. She's got to be because one, she was the there's only- a there's a reason that she did not stay at the Sea Bowls that night. So yes. there was some kind of plan. There had now, to be. I'm not saying it was had to do with the Sea Bolts. I'm just saying there's a reason she didn't want to be there. Right. She was the one taken. Right. She was the only one not in the house. Right. Now whether she was taken, so it's not about she- just kidnapping kids because there were three other kids in the house. Right. That they could have kidnapped. Right. He said, he stated that this, and he even stated that it was not out of the realm of possibility that Tina was involved and knew that it was going to happen See, and I, it was planned. I'm going to tell you, I thought that because of the way the bodies were staged right. with the mother being covered. Right. Dana, because like I said, we can't really see Johnny's head, so we don't know... Which they're not saying there's anything under his head, but they may just not say that. Right. Now, like I said, because we, there is no way that anybody, any outsider is going to solve this case because we only have, I don't even know that we have half of the information available. The only information we have available is what can be used to point, what people to use people, to point to, 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 to people, people that we know can right. do it. We don't have everybody's statements. Um... We don't have, we have partial statements from some people. We don't have any statements from some people. Um, but getting back to what I was going to say about Joel Lipsy is there are, according to Gambert, there are witnesses that have come forward that say that they did see him in the Ketty restaurant the night of the murders. And he's the one that went to the police and put himself in the investi, excuse me, in the investigation. Right. He went. Um, he was part of the search parties that were doing searches for Tina, in which we all know that there are those perpetrators who do that, who put themselves in the middle of an investigation. Yes, they do to keep from being... The only thing problem I have with him being a suspect is he couldn't have done it alone. No. And uh, there and again... Uh, who would have helped him? Would, his, would somebody in the house have helped him? Would it have been a planned thing? I don't know. I mean, I just know that it wasn't done by one person. No, it was not. Because three people could overtake one person. Two people could now, overtake unless, one person. You know, unless maybe if, if Johnny and Dana were hit in the head with a hammer... Like, say they were just sitting there they watching TV. They could have come TV. up behind them. Right. What if they came up behind them, knocked both of them in the head with a hammer to incapacitate them long enough to tie to get them tied up? I don't know. That's the only way I see. See, and another theory is mine is when they went in this house, did they really plan to kill anybody? They could. Well, I mean. Because. Unless it was, if there was a plan to kill somebody. It wasn't somebody from outside that came in planning that because they did not bring anything and with see, them that's to kill anybody. See, that's what I'm but saying. But if it was did somebody they just come in the house just to take Tina or one of the other kids, or since Tina was the only one missing, we're going to assume they came in after her. And then the others started interfering, and that's when they had to. I don't know. This case is just. Uh, it, I mean, there's. I honestly don't think that somebody went in that house to kill somebody that night. I honestly think that whatever happened I don't think this was a planned murder. No, that's I what I'm I think that saying. whatever happened, I think that whatever happened got out of hand and whatever happened started in that house. I don't believe and it And so was. that's what I'm saying. I don't think whoever was in that house that took Tina 
I don't think they went in there to kill anybody. Yeah, I don't think so either. And like you said, they they confronted them because they were in their house trying to get their sister. Or however it happened. Or either Tina just left. Do we know for sure? I mean, the only statement we have stating that Tina was even there at the time was because Justin said that she came out of the bedroom asking what's going on. But we already know that Justin's statement... She had to have been at home. How do we know that? She could have left after... After Sue went to bed. We don't know when she left that house. We don't, but what I'm saying is, is whoever went in that house that night and committed these murders. How do, my point is, how do we know that somebody from the outside came into that house and committed these murders? There is no indication whatsoever that I'm was, saying that only because Tina was missing and she was found dead not long and they confirmed that she died not long after the murders What if she just died happened. of exposure? It was summer. No, it, it was, was April, April. Well, in April. the Sierra Nevadas. I doubt it. I it was honestly, not summer, I mean, and it was not spring-like weather. In, in April in Sierra Nevada mountains, it's... I just don't... We just. Don't I'm just saying that we have no... First of all, we have no proof that Tina was murdered. The shoebox was something in it that she had made for school. Supposedly. That was missing. Then it turned into... That it was a toolbox that Johnny had made. So we don't really know. Now if it was the toolbox that was missing. There would be a reason for that. Because that would have been where the hammer was. Right. So was it a. There's Some people say it was the shoebox. Some people say it was the toolbox. That Johnny had made. That's just it. Nobody well, see, tells was, the same. I was thinking. Nobody tells the same story I, twice. What, what I was getting at is if it was the shoebox. Then she left on her own because that would be something that she wouldn't want to leave. Well, we know that she had time to, even if she was taken, somebody let her put her shoes on. At least, even if she went to bed and the clothes that she had on, she didn't wear her shoes to bed and she didn't wear her, ja- would wear her jacket to bed. So we know that whoever took her allowed her time to put on her shoes and her jacket. If somebody... See, it's something... I- I don't That's know. my whole thing. There's, I don't believe that just. I don't. Be, I don't trust I Justin's do statement. No, I do know that whoever killed these people did not go into that night expecting to kill nobody. I honestly don't believe. No, that. I don't think so either. I think whatever happened it got just, out of hand. Yes. But I'm just saying that we don't have evidence. I'm just looking at what we can prove. We can't prove that Tina was murdered. We can't prove that she was taken out of the house. Because I don't trust anything that Justin says. And if she just walked out... if it, Because what he says is she just walked out of her room dragging a blanket and asked what's, what's going on. And then was immediately snatched up. Well, we know that's not the case because she had on her. She took her shoes and she took her jacket. Right. Um. I just. I mean, it's just. It's a very confusing case. Now, I. I want to do this. Look at the dad, James Sharp. See, I'm still leaning back towards him. See, the only thing, the only record we can find of the only reason that he was actually cleared was because there was a request made to the military, to the Navy, for him to be um, to have surveillance on him for a few weeks. And I think the only reason he was cleared is because he didn't lead them to Tina. Right. But. that, But he would, this man would not be stupid enough to do that, I don't think. Well, there was, when you look at the phone records... For the calls that um, went out of the out of cabin twenty eight in the weeks right. leading up to the murders, supposedly Sue didn't want to, him him to know their phone number or where they right, were located. Right, because that's what she was said at the beginning of all of this. Well, was, somebody called him from that house. Right. In the weeks leading up to the murders, 
Somebody made a call to James Sharp. There Was it Tina? Was there a plan to, hey, I'm out here, you know... There's people, there's been claims made that Tina didn't get along with her mother. I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, there's so many rumors going around. Who knows? Um, Was she upset with her mother because she had been, um, maybe she wasn't getting enough attention. She didn't feel like she was getting enough attention. She felt like she had been, um, that her mother had allowed her to be abused, not really allowed it, but that she didn't protect her enough. Well, she got her away from there, though. Well, that's true, but maybe she didn't. I mean, it's hard to tell how a 12-year-old's going to see it. And then Sheila had been getting all this attention because Sheila had been pregnant. And I mean, I don't know. I'm just putting out stuff. You know, was it Tina that called him? Because, you know, Tina was supposedly his favorite child. See, I've thought that because whoever, I honestly believe that whoever come in that house that night that Sue and Johnny knew. I'm not going to say Dana knew them. Mm -hmm. But I think Tina knew... Tina knew something about what was going to happen that night. That's why she was not yeah. wanting to stay at the Sea Bolts. Or there could be another reason Tina wanted to be at the house that night. Because she knew Justin was going to be at the house that night. They're both 12 years old. Well, it could be. Why would she want to be in a house full of boys that ranged in age from 5 years old to 17 years old? Was that why Justin was awake and knew what time Dana and Johnny got home? Could have been. Because he had maybe snuck down the hallway to where Tina was. It's just a it's just a question. I don't know. <laughs> you got two 12-year-old. Maybe that's why she wanted to be at home that night because Justin was going to be there. Who knows? You know, I don't know. This, I don't know, people. I don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. But that still doesn't explain why his DNA was found around the dead bodies. I think that his DNA was found around Sue. Because I do think that part of his statement is true. The part where he said that he tried to help her. It could be. I think that he came out. I think that he did see... I don't know that he saw... I don't know what all he saw. I don't know how much he saw... But I do think that the reason um, that Is his DNA... Is he the one that placed those bodies that way because Dana's head was on the cushion? Was it her? I mean, was, was it, it him? Was it Tina? Was it Sheila? And let me ask you, let me tell you why. Because I've often wondered, why didn't her screaming wake up those boys? Is it because she didn't start screaming until she got far enough away did she move anything or touch anything in that crime scene before she went back to the Seabolts screaming? See, I've wondered that too, because a scream like that, I mean, because that would be a scream. Right. I mean, if I walked in and saw that. Did she, was she expecting to see it? Don't know. Is that why she didn't scream? I don't know. There's just so many weird things about this case. And all of Sheila's statements are in the... I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But they were asking her about how furniture was, um, you know, placed in the house. Asking her about stuff on the walls. And she couldn't tell them. But yet, 30 years later, when they're doing a walkthrough, her and Ricky, they do a walkthrough of the house before it was um, demolished. And she's able to recall little details then about how everything was set up in the house. Was it just that at at that time, was she just in shock and couldn't remember at the time? And maybe it's now. Who knows? Or is she just going off things, pictures she's seen or things that she's read or things that she's... That's why, I mean... That's why this case this case is never going to be solved, I don't believe. Because, first of all, the people that know are not telling. 
And I think that the people, there's, I think that, I think Justin knows more than he's telling. I think that Ricky knows more than he's telling. I think that um, Sheila knows more than she's telling. Yeah. Honestly, I do. I'm not saying that they did anything, and I'm not accusing them of doing anything. Or I just think that they have a better understanding and idea of what went on in that house that night than they are telling. And I don't know who they, why, or who they would be protecting. I don't know if they're protecting Tina. I don't. I don't know. Who knows? But we don't know. There's so many questions in this case, and I don't. Ha- I don't really know of a way to tie this up, because other than to say what I set out to do on this podcast, on this story, was to debunk the the all the evidence that um, against Marty and Bo that that just everybody says proves they are guilty. Like I said, I don't know if they are guilty or not, but I think that. The evidence, and I think that we've proven that the evidence that they have against Bo and Marty is really superficial and doesn't prove anything one way no, or the other. If you go on the evidence that they have, then they're not guilty. Well, right. I mean, they did. I mean, you can't look at what they have and and say without a doubt that these two men committed these murders. That was what my purpose of telling this story was. I didn't set out because there's no way. On the, based there's on the so information. many people that it could have been. There's, well, there's so, so many, many people that could have seen something. There's so many. I just think. I, I, honestly, I think their statements are out there. Their statements are out there, but we don't have access to them because that's not part of what was given to Josh Hancock. Right, but there. But and I they, think that these little leaks that are coming out, they're they're most definitely coming from Mike Gamberg, and I don't know what purpose he has of doing these little leaks here and there of this evidence is this evidence other than to put a frame up around Marty and Bo, which is what he he has been doing since 2013 at the, at the earliest, I think it started before then. Um, I think it started around 2004. Um, I don't know why. I mean, I guess the reason I don't know who is protecting who. I don't believe that there was this big conspiracy to um, protect someone back in 1981. No. But what I do believe is that there is a conspiracy to protect to, to, someone now. to protect someone now and to frame it around these two dead people who can't um, defend, defend themselves. themselves. And I think that's I think the conspiracy is the investigation that's going on now, and um, I think there's more of a conspiracy there. And as to why that would go on, I don't know. Other than it, they're protecting someone. I think that this whole I mean, if it weren't for Tina not being being the only one that wasn't in the house and not knowing enough about how she died or why she left that house, I would say that this had to do with drugs. Because it that's what it looks like. And I'm it and the fact that Tina kinda gets overlooked in this whole thing and they just go straight to these wild accusations and not focus on Tina when it's pretty obvious that she should be the focus of this. Yeah. Um and I think that it was made to look like a drug thing um because that's what everybody goes to it was over even the marty situation they say well john that's why he was wanting to cut johnny's hands off because he was stealing drugs from marty well i don't know if that's true and nobody does but i do know that um in my opinion that this that until the focus on this case is put on tina it's never gonna you're never going to find find out who did it or why uh-huh. and i think i i just there was a reason the bodies were moved 2 hours after they were dead right or longer at least 2 hours after they were dead there's a reason that sue's body was covered with a blanket that usually more than more than 99% of the time means that um, it was a female perpetrator, and that they right. were familiar with the um, 
victim. That's that's a statistical fact. Um, and until the folk, until the police put the focus on Tina, which I can't say for sure that they haven't, because we don't have all the files. All that's been leaked to us is what points to Marty and Bo. There's right. a reason for that. There is a reason for that. And until we have every all the information available, we're never going to know unless the police come out and actually say, this is what happened, here's the proof. And if they can prove that it was Marty and Bo, fine, but we're going to need more information than what, they, than what we have for us to be convinced that Marty and Bo right. committed these murders. Because I'm not convinced they've done it off of what we have right and i the motive doesn't make sense um the timeline doesn't make sense um there's just a lot that doesn't make sense putting the focus on tina is what makes sense in yes. this case see i thought that the whole time yeah the, it's, that the focus should have been on her right and i don't think sue was the um focus like everybody's trying no. to say it, it the, the evidence doesn't show that um so you know I don't know what to tell you guys <laughs> we don't know we're not going to be know, able to tell you the no. answer we hope that we've given you a lot of information and that we've given you enough to make a decision for yourself on whether or not you think Bo and Marty are guilty I'm not going to be the one to decide that for you no. but I did want to present both sides of the evidence against them and um you know, make it put 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 all the available information out there because right. most people don't go and research it themselves. They see what they see on TV and these reports, and they don't go any further because they think that it that's all there is. But that's not all there is. So I just wanted to dig a little deeper, give you a little bit more information, let you decide on whether or not you think they're innocent or guilty. Um, I just think that. The focus needs to be on Tina, and that's going to be my final word on that case. That if the focus isn't put on Tina, it there's no there's no way you're going to solve this case. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this story. Yes. I know that it's been uh, it's the, there's just so much, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of rumors, a lot of stuff that's not true. So I tried to kind of weed weed our way through all of that to get down to the bare bones of it. And I, you know, go research this for yourself because yeah. there's so there's so much out there. There, most of it's not fact. Most of it's rumor. But if you can weed through, you enough, can find the facts. Because I've looked it up after we started doing this. Okay, you can find the facts because these rumors. You're sitting there thinking to yourself, that don't make sense. Right. I mean, if you use common sense and make go through this, I mean, there's you can pull out. The facts, the facts from the rumors. But anyway, we we really hope you enjoyed this because I, <laughs> I mean we've uh, we've done some hard work on this case and um, I I don't I hate leaving it at this. Well, um, there's really no there's other really way no you other. Can leave I hate it. to leave it just hanging there, but there's really nowhere else to go with it. Um, other than I believe that. Tina is the key to this to solving this case. Yes. The focus should be on her actions, why she what did what happened she did, to her. what happened to Tina. Um and until that's done there's just no there's not gonna be any conclusion. And there and there may not be any way to find any of that out. There may not. You know, I mean it just I mean, because they really don't have a whole lot of her body. Right, and they don't have. Um, the, the there's not much information. Know is she about was her. not killed by blunt force trauma to the head. That's pretty much all we know. That's, because her skull that's was all we intact. know. Um, so anyway, we hope you enjoyed this series on the Katie Cabin murders. Yes, and if anything comes up, you can bet we will let you know. Um, just want to remind everybody. Um, you know, there's um, a couple of days left on our contest. Um, if you want to get in on that, just go to www.patreon.com slash onecrimepod um, and sign up there. Like I said, our mini soda is out now, so you can listen to that. Um, there's crime scene photos and stuff like that for this case on there. Also, I 
don't know if you want to look at those or not. So just use your own judgment on that. But they are available if you would like to look at them. And um, if you want to reach out to us, um, we're at Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, all at One Crime Pod. Or email us. Um, we can start a discussion going at um, One Crime at a Time at gmail.com. Yes. And just ask again if you um wherever you're listening to us if you could please go um give us a review rate us subscribe to us that would be very very helpful we would be eternally grateful for that um yes and i have to say that glowing mccoy oh that's right i I meant voting he overwhelmingly won won. (laughs) glowing mccoy is officially the greatest name Name ever ever. (laughs) We have de- it has been decided, people. <laughs> There's no question anymore. Yes, no, we, now we know. Now we know. Okay, well, um, so I just want to thank you guys again for listening and um, hanging in there with us. Um, we know this has been. We a, know this is this, this is case tough. has been a, a a boggle. So um, just thanks for hanging in there with us, and we'll be back again next week with a with a new case. Yes, and I um, don't know what it is. So nope. do not ask me on Twitter what it's going to be because I do not know. <laughs> you can ask me, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I honestly don't know what she's going to have for us. Next it's a time. good. I mean, it's it's a good one. It's another one that's pretty famous. Um, we're going to be, of course telling you some stuff you probably don't know about it um if it's pretty famous i may know about it i just don't know which one it is yeah yet. um but i've come up with some stuff that's not well known okay as i tend to do so um you anyway, like to give me headaches. I, I like <laughs> i like to dig deep people wow <laughs> I like to dig deep. All right, so we just th- thank you guys um, yes, thank for the you. support you've shown so far. We really appreciate it. And I guess until next week, we'll say see you next time. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Hi everyone, it's Shannon from One Crime at a Time, here to tell you about CBDMD. The people at CBDMD pride themselves on two things, quality and innovation. They take the highest quality hemp and combine it with the industry's most sophisticated manufacturing methods to create a product that is the first choice for a wide range of people looking for natural support. In fact, their CBD PM Sleep Aid and their CBD Freeze Topical for Pain Relief have both won awards for Product of the Year. If you're looking for a natural alternative for yourself or even for your pet, the choice is clear. Just follow the link in our show notes and see the variety of products CBDMD has to offer.